how do we edit an architectural interior to turn it from this into this? That's what we'll be looking at in this video today. Welcome back to this architectural photography editing series. In the previous video, I showed you how we culled our images down, how we got a set of proofs that we could send back to the client. And what I'm looking at here are the final selects that the client has gone for, but these are not my polished, finished versions. They are literally what I call the proofs, where they've had a limited amount of correction applied to them. More often than not, the only edit that has been applied to these photos is the initial preset, which is generic, and that's applying highlight and shadow corrections. It's trying to bring back some of that dynamic range that exists in the file just so the client can get a sense of what that final finished image can look like but one of the key adjustments that I make during this initial proofing stage is to make sure that I've corrected the geometry so if I jump to the photo that we're going to be working on in this example and I click this tool here you can see that I've actually drawn four guides on this photo just to control the vertical and the horizontal and if I reset everything to the original state you can see that all of a sudden we have a file that is devoid of any real dynamic range we're losing a lot of detail in the shadows but more importantly and maybe more disconcerting to the client is the geometric distortion that we can see where the original file is suffering from a couple of things one being the barrel distortion of the lens at the six millimeters at which I shot this and also the geometric convergence of the horizontal lines so if I press Control Z to undo that reset and we'll see what the client actually got through and this was my intention when I actually took the photo something more like this so this gives the client a really good indication of what that finished file can look like but obviously there are issues with this photo that we are going to need to overcome during our post-production editing process and that's what we can look at in this video so before our photo editing can fix the problems, we need to identify what they actually are. And so for me in this example, the three main things that we would need to look at are the overexposure of the exterior of the property here. So we have a nice view outside of the sliding doors here that I would certainly like to bring back. The second issue would be one of a color cast. And if I come into the basic selection and just grab the saturation slider and crank that all the way up and also boost up the vibrance as well, you can actually see those color casts become more pronounced and the main issue is the differential between interior lighting which has more of a yellow hue compared to that blue exterior so we'll need to fix that up as well I'll just double click those to reset them and the other issue if I zoom in here is you will see I had a couple of dust spots on my sensor which I'll also need to clean up but no big deal and once we fix those issues up, I'll show you a really nice approach just for applying the finishing polish to your edit that's really gonna to help to elevate your photos. Okay, so I took seven photos in this one location, maybe a little bit of overkill, but you can see with the darkest exposure, we've got all the information we need for those bright highlights outside of the window there. And if I jump to the very brightest exposure, all of a sudden you can see we've got all of the detail that we would need in these deep dark shadows here as well. Those of you familiar with my architectural photo editing tutorials will know that I have a lot of different methods that I use for bringing back the high dynamic range that is available to us through a bracketed set of images. But in this one, I'm gonna cover an approach that I don't think I've shown on my channel before. And so what I'm gonna do is just select the seven bracketed images, right click inside of Lightroom and come to Photo Merge HDR. I'm pretty confident that the camera didn't move in between shots, so auto align isn't necessary. However, I always turn this on just in case there was any slight movement for some reason. I leave auto settings on purely out of curiosity because I like to see what Lightroom is suggesting for bringing back that high dynamic range in the file. However, it's actually pretty irrelevant because I am going to copy the settings that I've already created here in the proof that I sent through and apply that to the HDR image. There should be very little ghosting of objects, i.e. move of objects in the scene apart from perhaps a little bit of movement of leaves outside the window here so I always leave my decoasting amount to low unless I'm aware that there was something moving in the frame during that bracketed series however while I'm on site if I notice that something was moving I will normally shoot another bracketed set of images and go with the set where there was minimal movement so really not too much for us to worry about in terms of the dialogue settings here so I just click merge and then let Lightroom do its thing if I were to be using the method I'm sharing with you in this video across the whole set of images, I would automate this process so that Lightroom was creating an HDR merge for me for every single one of these bracketed sets. 
And while it did that and crunched the numbers, I'll go and make myself a coffee. But I'm not gonna do that for this series of photos because I want to share with you guys different methods and different approaches for each of these edits. And so if you're interested in architectural photography, real estate photography, editing methods, go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already and hit the bell icon so that you're notified as and when I post those videos. Okay, so now we've got our HDR image, but as you can see, we've lost all of those geometric transformations that we had previously made. And so all I do is make sure that I've selected the proof that I sent through to my client, select sync and just check all and synchronize. And now if I click the HDR image and go back to the original, you can't really see much of a difference. And if I press N so that we can see a side by side comparison, at first glance, you can't really see too much of a difference. The big benefit to us now is that this one file actually contains all the information that we've pumped into it. So we have the information from this darker exposure. We have the information from the brighter exposures and that all exists now in this one file. We just need to mine the file to bring that data back. And I think the worst way to do it is using the sliders inside of Lightroom itself. So for example, we could grab the highlight slider and bring that down. We could bring the shadow slider and boost that up. And we could tweak our file this way and just try and bring that information back into the one file. But the problem is the look of the file gets pretty ugly pretty quickly when you take this approach. The further apart you push the highlights and the shadows, the blacks, and the whites and you reintroduce the dynamic range and you grab the contrast to bring that back as a really quick down and dirty fix perhaps even for real estate photography this could be the approach you take however for high-end architecture it really doesn't look good and so there's a much better way that we can do this so i'm just going to resynchronize those original settings so we're gonna do all the heavy lifting of editing the photo, bringing back all of the highlights and the shadows in a much more refined way inside of Photoshop. So I come down to the image thumbnail, right click, come to edit in, and I don't want to select edit in Photoshop. What I actually want to do is select open as smart object in Photoshop. And so that's going to mean that we still have access to all that amazing high dynamic range data that is built into this file. So if I double click the thumbnail here, that's gonna open up our camera raw editor. So we've got access to pretty much the same sliders that we have inside of Lightroom and so now we can come in make adjustments to the layer inside of Camera Raw. So what we're going to do is create two versions from the same file. One that's going to predominantly control the interior brightness, the kitchen itself. So this one for example looks pretty good with an exposure boost of 1.3 and let's say we're happy with that and click OK. And next I'm going to use the same file to create an exposure for the exterior. And so I come over to the layer, I right click and it's very important to note we don't duplicate the layer, we come down to new smart object via copy. And the reason for that is if I double click this layer and come down and start making adjustments to it, when I click OK, those adjustments, if I duplicated the layer, would be applied to the layer underneath as well. It would just be an exact copy and they would always be linked. However, because we have created a copy via the smart object, we're now free to actually make our changes so we can bring back the details for the exterior here. And when I click OK, the bottom layer is not going to be affected. And now my goal for this layer is to bring back the detail here, which it looks like I've done at the moment. But at the same time, I don't want to darken down the interior too much. And the reason for that is if we can keep the luminosity, the brightness of the interior similar to the layer underneath, then when we blend the two together, it's going to be a much more believable blend. And so I'm gonna just grab the shadows and start bringing those up slightly and that starts to brighten up the interior without affecting the exterior too much. I can even bring the black point up. I don't wanna lose my contrast, so I'm gonna boost that up a little bit. And I don't need to get too carried away with this because most of the skill in combining these two layers now actually comes from the masking itself. So I'll press F on the keyboard just to give us a little bit more screen real estate. Drag this over so you guys can see it a little better. And now I need to bring back these brighter areas that exist outside in the garden. And so I'm just gonna hide this layer for now and we're gonna make our mask based on our original base layer. Now one way we can grab the brightest pixels here and create a luminosity mask is to come into the channel section and just have a look at which channel would best give us this selection out here. But as you can see, we're still gonna be picking up a lot of the interior because that's very bright and white as well. And so I actually prefer nowadays to use a dedicated tool 
it's pretty inexpensive but basically allows you to select L2, L1 and this is a much more precise way to quickly go about selecting the brightness values in your photo and getting this tool has been some of the best money I've spent. So if you guys are interested in getting hold of this to help your workflow I've got a link in the description below. In terms of helping you make selections in your photos it's absolutely invaluable. You can select your shadows, select your midtones, control how wide or how tight you want that mask to be. So in this photo I'm just going to click L2 because I think that gives us a nice bit of definition between the darker framing here and then the brighter area outside there and then all we do is simply click mask and now when we come back to our layers and we can turn the visibility of this layer on and now that we're bringing back detail into that overexposed area outside but absolutely we can go further than this. So let me give this a toggle on and off and you can get a sense of what's going on outside and in the picture as a whole. Now as you can probably tell as I turn this on we're getting a much flatter interior but I don't care in the slightest all I care about is what's going on outside of this window here so the fact that we're getting a muddy flattened version on the interior don't care whatsoever and the reason for that is I'm not going to see it over here because I'm going to use a technique that I often use which I call double masking. So all I do is create a new group that I'm going to drag this layer into and what that's going to allow me to do is just create a brand new mask on top of everything and if I fill it with black just by pressing Control delete I can now grab a paintbrush, press D for the default color, so that's gonna put the white brush, and as you know, white reveals, and now I can just click and start painting. And you can see that I'm actually painting this with 100% opacity, 100% flow, so I'm not even being particularly precise with this, and that's just painting that exterior back in pretty much perfectly. So let's look at our before, and our after, now we've got the best of both worlds. We've got our exterior brought back and we haven't muddied out any of this interior. If that rough mask has bled over certain areas that you didn't want it to, like just over the wall here, you can just come in and use really quick methods such as, you know, like a nice rectangular marquee. Just delete it there. Because we've only brought back the highlighted pixels outside, you may feel that you're just losing a little bit of contrast out there, which I think we are. And if that is the case, what you can do is just come down to this layer duplicate the layer and it doesn't matter this time that we're duplicating it we're happy with this as it is we're going to drag this up to the top and I'm just going to press Control delete to fill that with black grab my brush and providing that I stay away from the edges I can come in and very roughly paint this in I can change my opacity to 50% by pressing the 5 key and maybe just paint a little bit of that in and that's just going to help to add a little bit more contrast out there if you want a little bit over the frame we can do that as well and if we hold alt or option on the Mac and click on the mask you can see just how rough and ready that mask is and the one previously that we created let's have a look at that one so using this precision mask that Lumenzia created for us we are then able to very quickly and roughly just come in with our paintbrush and just be pretty crude and paint in that paint in that and so if I group these together control G and I hide that group we can turn that on and off and you can see just how very quickly we're able to bring back all of that exterior detail. No need for extra flash shots, no need for flambient, we're able to do that all with post-production. Okay, that's the hardest part of our edit done, merging the exterior with the interior, getting those two differing brightness values to talk to each other in one cohesive photo. So now I feel like we've done that, what we can do is create a stamped visible copy of this with the monster shortcut, Control, Alt, Shift and E. Oh my gosh, what a monster shortcut that is, but I love it, so useful. We've got a stamped copy of everything that was visible on our screen, we now have that in one layer. And that's what I normally do before I start doing my retouching and by retouching I mean just fixing things up such as these little dust spots here and for that I'll often use the spot healing brush tool because it's a nice one-click fix so if you see your little dust spots up there paint over them gone really easy and I will normally zoom in and just pan around the frame and just check that there's nothing else that's catching my eye so for instance these little light fixtures here I hate having things cut half off at the edge of frames um, so I'm going to remove those I'm also going to remove that as well it just makes for a much nicer cleaner image in my opinion and sometimes things that are supposed to be there like the little uh, wood grain mark there I also take them out if they're visually distracting there's often little bits of dust on the floor as well, which you can absolutely retouch those as well. However, I don't normally go too nuts with those because I just feel like it's a little bit of overkill. You're never going to see those, but like those big marks there, if I turn this off, 
and on you can see that is a little bit distracting so I will remove those and again I'm just making my way around the edge of the frame checking I'm happy with it a little bit of flare from this light I'll remove that and now if I'm happy with that retouch, which I am, I can go to work on the color balance. And a good idea to get a sense of where things are going wrong is to create a hue saturation layer and just grab the saturation slider and start cranking that all the way up. And then you can better see the color casts. So we can see that what should be white is actually yellow predominantly, a bit of orange. And then we've got blue contamination from the daylight here and also down here as well. Just like with the exposure blending, there's different ways to tackle color casts. But let me show you one of my favorite Ways. I'll come into select and I'm going to select color range. I'm going to move that out of the way and all I do is click on an area then I'll come to the plus icon here and I'll find the fuzziness at 39, 28% for the range is a pretty good place for my editing and then I just click and hold the mouse and I start painting over these areas of white and you can see in the little mask that it's giving you a preview of in this window here we're starting to add all of this area that should be pure white it's just adding it in and leaving the other areas alone if you're picking up extra areas that you shouldn't such as on the floor down here you can see in the mask that it's starting to turn gray so we are picking some of that up just select the eyedropper tool with a minus there and just come down here give it a click start to move that up move it across here maybe remove this little area outside as well we don't need to be too precise click OK and now we're going to have the marching ants representing that selection and all we need to do is create a hue saturation layer and we can just grab the saturation and bring it down and you can see if I pull this all the way down we get a completely neutralized white and I really don't like this this is completely over the top some people are so scared of color cast that they try and remove it completely and it just destroys the plausibility of their photo and that's what that looks like here it might look like quite a nice clean frame but to me to my eye this is completely unbelievable and by the same token how it was in reality also does not look good and so you need to go with the Goldilocks principle where you you know it's not too saturated it's not too undersaturated but it's just right and often somewhere around that minus 50 mark is a pretty good place to set it so let's jump back to our layers and let's look at our before and our after before and after so things are looking pretty good, but I said at the beginning of the video that we'd look at a really great method for finishing off your photos. So the old me would now be coming in, I'd be doing things such as running sharpening filters just to clean this up. I might be adding some curves to try and bring a little bit of local contrast, maybe working on global contrast as well. Very likely I'd end up with another five to 10 layers on top of this one just to refine things. However, in terms of quality, speed and efficiency, the best way to do this is to automate it. And the way that I do that is create another stamped visible layer here. And we're going to use a filter plugin that's going to improve our photo in so many ways. And the one that I really like using is Luminar AI. As you probably know, Luminar AI is a standalone photo editor. But for my architectural photography and workflow, what I like to do is leverage its AI tools. And although I'll show it to you in action on this particular photo, usually I won't run it as a one off basis on each photo. Rather, I'll apply it as a batch process on all of the photo edits from a particular photo shoot. But what I've done is I utilize things such as the Accent AI filter, which does a multitude of things such as improving color, local and global contrast, all of those sorts of things that we like to do for architectural photography. We also have Structure AI, which is similar to increasing clarity, but it's doing it with an AI engine behind it. In the details section, we've got Luminar sharpening tool, which I find to be very good. And we can also boost up the small, medium, and the large details in the photo as well. I've just been slamming these sliders around, but just so you can quickly see, this is an example of what we brought in as I release that. That's what Luminar can do for us. And as I zoom in and show you a before and after, you can see that we can bring a lot of sharpness and a lot of texture detail back into the photo. That was a very unrefined example. So instead, what I'll do is come into my templates, come to my templates, and I'm just gonna apply one of my architectural presets and that just utilizes the tools we just looked at plus a few more just to enhance my photo from this to this. So from a pretty good edit that we sent in from Photoshop to this that just has a lot more punch to it. And if I click apply, that's gonna bring this back into Photoshop as a layer. And now we're back inside Photoshop, we have our layer. So we have our before and after. So obviously what we can do if we decide it's too much, we can reduce the opacity. 
We can apply a mask to it and just paint in the effect as and where we want it. But as I said, my preference is to batch apply that preset once all my photos have been edited through Photoshop. Super easy. And if you guys want to get hold of Luminar AI, I've got a discount code which works through the link in the description below. And if you do get it and want me to share my exact setup for that preset that I showed you, I'll be glad to do that as well. Just let me know in the comments. But for now, guys, thanks so much for watching and I will see you in the next video where we'll take a different photo from this photo shoot and I'll share some different methods for creating an end result that hopefully your clients will love. Catch you in the next video.